Well, thanks for coming, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, I'm Keith Richburg uh, from the uh, HKU Journalism and Media Studies Center. We're across the campus over on in Elliott Hall. And so we're happy to co-sponsor uh, today's book talk with the uh, Department of History, as you see up there on the screen. See other people still showing up. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started here so we can get you out on time. Uh, so we're happy to really uh, co-sponsor this with the Department of History because it really deals with uh, historical topics. And also I just want to let everybody know that there are books available in the back if you'd like to uh, pick one up on your, on your way out. And I guarantee you, you could probably get it signed by the author afterwards. I'm sure I would be glad to. Um, so today's, uh, today's guest, Philip Bowering, first uh, has been in Hong Kong for a very long time. He first came here in 1973, I was told, for both the Financial Times and the Far Eastern Economic Review, worked for both, but ended up pretty much we know him as the Far Eastern Economic Review, where he later rose to become editor. Um, many of you might recognize uh, Philip Bowering, um, if not because he's a regular around town, if not from the Foreign Correspondence Club where he's a member, but he's also an able yachtsman. You might have seen him down at the Yacht Club, but you might recognize him from just right here at HKU because much of the research for this book, I'm told, was done right here at the, uh, like, uh, taking advantage of the resources at the HKU library. And uh, I would, uh, if the topic is, uh, the topic is going to be back up there in a second, it's uh, fascinating. It's about the, uh, it's about the history of the, of the archipelago that we call uh, now the South China Sea. I'll just say just uh, you know, a personal note, when I was a correspondent for the Washington Post in the late 80s, I first visited Vietnam, and I was asking someone in, in an interview through a translator about the South China Sea, and they looked a bit perplexed, and there was a bit of back and forth, and they turned to me and said, I think you mean the Eastern Sea. And so even what you call it is different. And I'm told now in the Philippines it's known as the West Philippine Sea, and it's even got a different name in Indonesia, in Indonesian. So uh, even what you call things can be uh, can kind of interpreted. Uh, I, I'm going to let uh, Philip Bowering explain all of that and more. And so without further ado, um, see Philip's going to tell you all about this book. And uh, uh, should we get started now? All right. Okay, Philip Bowering. I'll sit down now, and we'll be back up later for Q and A. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Keith. Uh, I'm a journalist, but I'm also uh, started life as a historian. I never studied journalism, so I went from being a historian to a journalist and now back to trying to be a historian. Uh, and I think the two things actually work together rather well. Uh, as you probably know, journalism is supposed to be the first draft of history. Uh, so. Journalists need to be aware of uh, that uh, what they are writing may actually uh, become part of a uh, historical record. Uh, at the same time, journalists also need to uh, preferably learn some history themselves. Uh, you know, I, one sees sometimes you know people being dispatched to cover situations, and they really know you know extraordinarily little about the background of, of where they're going. I mean, it's as though, uh, let's say, an Iraqi journalist from Mosul was dispatched to the US and had never known that there was a, had been a civil war, that there had been slavery, and so on. So uh, whatever one does as a journalist, it, it helps insofar as one can, and it becomes more and more difficult given te pressures of time, uh, to uh, you know, do a little bit of digging uh, into history, and that applies I mean, not, not to distant history, it, it, it may apply to the history of just uh, two years ago, uh, depending obviously on, on the subject. The other thing I think about, you know, writing about history from a journalistic uh, point of view is that one must beware of adopting current uh, moral standards to events of the past. Uh, or indeed expressing shock horror about things which are happening today in one country which were actually happening in your own country only 30 years ago. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, what's happened? Hang on, I better move this. Um, hmm? it just keep no, 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 it wasn't, it just went out altogether. Okay. Yeah. Um, So without further ado, I'm going to you know, uh, take you very briefly through 
the history that I've described in this, uh, in this book. Um, and uh, it's a very long history that I've uh, written in terms of time. It's large in terms of space. But the object of doing this is to try and uh, make it comprehensible to how we got to be where we are now. Uh, it is slightly controversial in two ways. Uh, first of all, it deals uh, almost entirely with what is called Austronesian Asia. Uh, Austronesia being a language group, which uh, is a language group of uh, the archipelago, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, and uh, it's also found in uh, Taiwan, in the original population, and in Madagascar. Uh, as well as, of course, out across the Pacific, uh, Pacific Islands, and formerly, of course, in uh, Hawaii and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so how did this uh, Asian uh, Austronesia come about? Well, there uh, is uh, a map uh, which shows this uh, region uh, 15,000 years ago. And you will see that uh, most of it's joined up. Uh, Java, Sumatra, Borneo, these are all part of mainland Asia. Uh, Philippines wasn't quite, except for Palawan uh, was. Uh, there was no Malacca Strait. 15,000 years, not very long actually. Aborigines have been in Australia for uh, 45,000. So, you know, we're dealing here with really in human terms, very recent developments. Uh, so what happened? Uh, well, we had the Ice Age, which reached its peak around about 22,000 years ago. And then you had the melting of that ice, which led to the rise in the sea levels. So that what uh, once would have been inhabitable land, uh, 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 probably savanna type land all across the uh, the uh, southern and western part of uh, the uh, South China Sea uh, would have been uh, settled. We don't know much about who settled it or uh, what uh, their conditions were, but uh, there certainly would have been people there uh, who were uh, driven out by the uh, rising waters. Um, which brings us to uh, Austronesians. Now, how did the Austronesians come to be uh, dominating the islands of the uh, archipelagos and, uh, and the coasts? Um, well, um, it seems that they, as the waters were rising, they became the first ones to uh, master the sea. They had to master the sea because um, the only way they could get around, because you, these are not islands with the uh, large flat surfaces. These are places which are joined uh, where people can only go from one place to another frequently by boat. Uh, likewise, only go from one island to another by boat. Um, so these uh, Austronesian speaking people, um, it's not entirely clear uh, whether they move from the north to the south or south to the north, but anyway, uh, we won't go into that particular uh, debate merely to say that they established themselves in uh, the Philippines, uh, Borneo, Sumatra, Java, Malay Peninsula, and uh, this is uh, often now forgotten, uh, coast of Vietnam. Um, and the ones at the coast of Vietnam actually probably came from Borneo, or well, they might have come from the Philippines. It's not, in, again, it's not entirely clear, um, but all these people had certain uh, characteristics, um, cultural characteristics. Um, and there is one of the cultural characteristics. Uh, it's a burial jar, a burial, secondary burial. Uh, this one is from Palawan uh, in the Philippines. Uh, it's about 3,000 years old. Uh, and the uh, most interesting aspect of it, quite apart from the uh, very nice decoration, the figures on the top, two people in a boat. Uh, now, 
As far as these people were concerned, boats weren't just a way of getting around in, in the temporal world. They were uh, actually very important in the afterlife. So boats took you around in the afterlife, um, which explains why they turn up on, the, on a burial jar. So, I mean, this is just one of many uh, types of, of, uh, uh, of um, artifact which are found, uh, not as beautiful as this, but I mean, were common uh, throughout this uh, Austronesian region. Uh, there are various others. Uh, that one is tattooed people. Now, uh, that is a very extreme example of tattooing which comes from, uh, from Cebu uh, in the Visayas. Um, but tattooing was uh, common throughout um, and remains actually common um, if you look at, uh, say, in Maori traditions and, and so on. Uh, and only disappeared from the Philippines uh, after the Spanish arrived. Uh, and uh, so it, it's uh, just one of uh, those cultural characteristics that uh, um, is, uh, defines, or at least certainly did define, uh, Austronesian Asia and, and beyond. Uh, now, moving rapidly on, because we've got a lot of uh, long journey to, to, uh, to make. Um, the uh, sea, uh, ability, seamanship abilities of the uh, Austronesians uh, came to link with the uh, sea-going people of the Roman Empire. Uh, they did this via India. Uh, if we go back to the beginning of uh, the uh, first millennium, we will see that uh, uh, Rome had uh, conquered Egypt and developed a huge trade with, with India. A uh, hundred Roman galleys a year were going to India, most of the west coast, but some of them were around to the east coast where there were Roman settlements, there are documents dating uh, from this era, uh, written in Greek. Most of the uh, traders were, in fact, Greeks from Alexandria. Um, and uh, Indians traveled to Alexandria as records of that in, 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 in uh, Roman times. Um, and the Romans also observed uh, uh, what they call rafts. Um, the rafts were clearly uh, catamaran-type boats, boats with outriggers. And the only people who had boats with outriggers in those days were the people from, uh, from Austronesia. Uh, these were the same outrigger boats that uh, took, uh, took uh, uh, Austronesians across the Pacific and settled uh, uh, Hawaii, Tahiti, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, there were also links between uh, the uh, Sumatra and the Pen Malay Peninsula and India. Um, Indians refer to uh, that region as uh, Savanabum, uh, land of gold, uh, because it was a <coughs> producer of gold as well as of tropical products of various sorts. And some of these found their way uh, to Rome, some of them found their way to Baghdad, some of them found their way to, uh, uh, to India, and, uh, and, also, uh, and also to China. So, um, with the first uh, Romans we know who visited uh, uh, China uh, in the second century uh, of the first millennium, uh, they went uh, by boat to India, across from India to uh, the west coast of the Malay Peninsula, probably somewhere around uh, Kedah, Penang. Um, took a land journey across to the other side of the peninsula, and from there, by boat again, um, well, the first ones actually ended up at, uh, somewhere around Haiphong at the time when that was under Chinese rule. Um, but th that was the main 
uh, trade route uh, for quite a while. And the first big uh, state which was established uh, was the Kingdom of Funan, which was based on the Mekong Delta. And they controlled the trade uh, really all the way from the uh, coast of what is now Vietnam all the way through to the uh, west coast of the peninsula uh, from whence it was taken by uh, Indians. Um, now, the Indian influence was massive. Um, Hindus, Buddhists, um, and uh, that uh, is just one of many examples of uh, early Hindu uh, um, buildings. That's uh, temples at Dieng Plateau in central Java, uh, but there's plenty of others to be found in, 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 um, in Vietnam, uh, Nha Trang in particular, um, and, in, uh, and in Malaysia. Uh, the Bujang Valley in Kedah uh, again has temples which Hindu temples uh, the, which date the earliest and date back to uh, around about uh, the year 200 possibly earlier we're not quite sure uh, so you can see there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of trade going on there's a lot of influence uh, coming through traders the Indian traders who brought uh, religion and they also brought kingship systems which were important in establishing uh, the states um, in, uh, in Sumatra, in Java, uh, in, uh, in Champa on the Vietnamese coast um, and so on and actually reaching um, much further uh, uh, sorry, I'll just go back a bit reaching much further west, uh, sorry, east, um, as far as uh, uh, Mindanao, uh, Butuan in Mindanao, Surigao, uh, and, uh, and Manila. Uh, there are uh, inscriptions dating back to about 900 in, uh, in, uh, in Manila, in uh, uh, copper, uh, copper engravings with uh, uh, in uh, written in uh, old Javanese, um, so you can see this massive influence that was uh, uh, coming um, f from India, but also it didn't actually take over in the sense of linguistically. It was only as important in establishing uh, state systems. Um, as for the trade. Uh, China was uh, a major attraction for trade. Uh, Chinese themselves were not engaged in the trade, um, but uh, uh, there was demand in China for uh, uh, luxury products which came, some of them from Arabia, some of them from eastern archipelago, spices, uh, tropical products, uh, camphor and uh, things of that sort, pearls, tortoiseshell, um, ivory, uh, and in return, the Chinese have, you know, exported uh, uh, various manufacturers, uh, ceramics, uh, uh, silk, of course, um, although silk was fairly high value, so it wasn't, you know, it, uh, it wasn't a major item of trade in, in, in terms of bulk. Uh, there were much bigger uh, kinds of uh, item being trade, traded. Um, so uh, what happened around about 300 uh, in this current era um, was instead of crossing the uh, peninsula by land, uh, the um, sailors developed routes uh, down the Malak Straits so to take advantage of the seasonal winds. Now, one of the other consequences of the end of the Ice Age was this climate change, and climate change brought about the monsoon winds that we know today, the northeast monsoon in, uh, in, in, the, in the winter and the southwest monsoon in the summer. And uh, if you're at the equator, you also get a seasonal uh, wind shift from east, uh, east-west to west-east. Uh, so the people who actually live 
uh, the point where these winds uh, converge, i.e., uh, in particular, Java and Sumatra, uh, have the advantage of being able to trade north, south, east, and west. Um, so the trade tended to move uh, you know, on a seasonal basis uh, by ship all the way to China um, and across to India and across to the uh, uh, eastern archipelago. Um, but the, 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 the land trade still continued because obviously the, uh, the cross, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, um, sailing all the way was dependent on the, on the seasons uh, whereas the uh, cross peninsula trade was less dependent on, on seasonal winds. Uh, this all led uh, to the rise of the power of Sri Vijaya. Sri Vijaya, Buddhist uh, kingdom in uh, Sumatra, East Sumatra, based on what is now Palambang, uh, partly in Palambang, partly in uh, um, uh, nearby, um, uh, along that coast, they dominated the, the trade because they got organized, they organized other ports, um, and they were the ones who, they participated in trade themselves, but uh, they also were in a position to extract, uh, essentially extract dues from people passing through, uh, and the fact that people had to stop you know, there, uh, waiting for the winds to change. Um, but the, uh, uh, the first uh, Chinese uh, accounts of this uh, actually come not from traders, uh, but from Buddhist monks, because uh, Sri Vijaya became a great center of Buddhist learning. Uh, and uh, so Chinese monks would come and stay in, uh, in, in, in uh, Palembang, and they would uh, improve their knowledge of Buddhist scriptures, and uh, from then, from there, they would make their way to uh, uh, Sri Lanka, probably, or maybe to India, uh, for even more advanced study. So, uh, you have descriptions uh, in Chinese records of of, uh, of there being a thousand Buddhist monks in in uh, in what is now Palembang. Uh, so you can see what sort of uh, um, impact trading was having on, uh, on this region and how this region was taking advantage of that um, and uh, getting fairly rich in the process. And uh, um, so this uh, network that uh, the Three Vijayans established um, it, you know, extended to a whole lot of small ports on the Sumatran coast, on the peninsula, uh, North Java coast, um, uh, as far as Luzon and Mindanao. Um, I mean, it wasn't. A, it's called an empire. It was. Uh, it was a very loose kind of framework, and it was based on trade rather than, uh, uh, than on actually ruling the land or the people. Um, but they were the most important people at the time, and uh, it's interesting that. Uh, when they were running the trade, uh, they didn't send trade missions to China because it wasn't necessary. Trade missions only went to China when there was competition between, uh, between states, uh, between ports, to try and get uh, Chinese to deal with them rather than deal with somebody else. Uh, but everywhere, you know, there was uh, tribute trade was actually just a sort of a tax and the Chinese uh, would pay tax uh, if they went to uh, uh, if they went to Luzon and had to deal with the local Datu or whoever. Uh, they would have to give gifts in the same way that the the the, the, the uh, uh, Austronesians or maybe the Indians would have to pay uh, you know a tribute when they went to China. Uh, this was a, a commercial issue; it wasn't uh, a political one. Uh, So at the time when Sri Vijaya was at its peak, um, most of the trade was actually, it, with China, was being done by Arabs, by Persians, and by Tamils. Uh, 
uh, and that counts the fact that there were uh, tens, reportedly tens of thousands of foreigners living in Guangzhou around about the year 800. Uh, uh, this was the height of the Tang dynasty. It was also the height of the Abbasid dynasty in, in, uh, in, in Persia, Iraq, and Central Asia. So you had a period of great prosperity uh, from which uh, you know, the uh, Austronesian um, trading states uh, uh, benefited dramatically. Um, so you had this association of trade uh, global trade or semi-global um, because it reached everywhere except uh, the Americas um, creating prosperity both for the you know the empires and for the intermediaries uh, in, in this part of the world uh, it also uh, demonstrate the abilities sailing and, and uh, boat building abilities of the uh, uh, the Austronesians. Uh, this was the period of the settlement of Madagascar. Uh, the Mad language of Madagascar is de it's derived primarily from uh, uh, the language of southwest Borneo, um, but there's significant words coming from uh, Javanese and Sanskrit and, and, and Malay. Malay being a language originally from uh, Sumatra. Uh, and this is uh, here is a replica of a boat uh, built um, on the lines of one which appears in stone in the uh, in temples of uh, Borobudur uh, in central Java. Uh, this was built in 2004. Traditional materials, and it was sailed uh, from uh, from. Jakarta to Madagascar in 41 days. Now uh, that's uh, pretty good sailing. Uh, you do well to do that today, actually. Uh, so that boat could probably do about seven or eight knots f fairly steadily. Uh, um, that one was only a 20, 28 foot, uh, sorry, 28 uh, uh, meters, but uh, there were much bigger ones. Um, probably. Um, I mean, the, there are descriptions again of Chinese, Chinese uh, documents of uh, f vessels of up to 50 meters. That's if we can, I mean, there are all kinds of issues about the interpretation of Chinese data on the subject, but uh, uh, anyway, the, there were large ships which crossed the Indian Ocean, and the Javanese um, in particular. It, they didn't just sail to Madagascar. They had, you know, they they traded across the Indian Ocean. They traded to Yemen. Uh, they they transported slaves to one uh, to Guangzhou. Um, you know, there were African slaves in Guangzhou at that time. Um, so but this is a, a a very significant uh, development, um, and you can see it actually. Uh, now, you might think that those girls were from the uh, Philippines or Indonesia or you know, uh, somewhere not very far from here. Actually, there's from Madagascar. That's a girls' choir in Madagascar. Uh, so it tells you something about the uh, extent of genetic influence in Madagascar, uh, as well as, of course, the um, uh, linguistic uh, links which I've referred to earlier. But it does tell you a lot about uh, uh, the ability of, uh, of the Javanese and Sumatran uh, boat builders and seafarers and the traders who uh, accompanied them. Um, so much so that, you know, I'll, I'll fast forward a bit, sorry. The, that, uh, that's a slightly out of sequence. I, that is, I mentioned the... Uh, um, that's uh, Nha Trang, Hindu temples in Nha Trang uh, in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, at the time, uh, that part of Vietnam was the Hindu kingdom of Champa, uh, which uh, spoke an Austronesian <coughs> language and uh, had scripts which are derived <coughs> from Indian scripts. Um, these again, uh, 
about the same period or about a thousand years ago. These are uh, gold uh, uh, ornaments from, uh, from Mindanao in the Philippines. Um, this, this was from Surigao, which is in uh, northern Mindanao. Um, oh, and that, uh, I, I mentioned the uh, copper plate uh, found in, in uh, near Manila, um, Laguna. Um, that is the plate inscribed in uh, uh, old Javanese, uh, and it's clearly, it's a document uh, referring to um, the repayment of a debt. Uh, so it's a, it, it demonstrates the degree of sophistication that, that must have existed uh, at that settlement uh, on Manila Bay at that time. Uh, here are more gold ornaments from that uh, around about the same period. Um, so we'll now sort of fast forward again a bit um, from the Javanese, uh, sorry, from the Sumatran based uh, Srivijayan Empire, which actually uh, got its strength latterly, not just from its position on the uh, Malacca Straits, um, but from its uh, dynastic alliance with central uh, Java. Um, and that was the period, of course, where you had, uh, I mentioned earlier, the Borobudur ship we had the temple of Borobudur, a Buddhist temple, um, but uh, the Javanese switched, they were originally Hindu, uh, became Buddhist under their Srivijayan influence and then uh, switched back to, uh, to uh, Hinduism and uh, it remained uh, Hindu uh, uh, ever after, um, until at, le at least until the arrival of, 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 of uh, Islam. Uh, the uh, period of uh, the next period of, of uh, uh, sort of Javanese uh, ascendancy. I mean, they never uh, it never collapsed completely, but uh, it didn't have the same glories uh, after Borobudur and, uh, and so on for quite some time. Uh, for various reasons, but uh, nonetheless it, it continued to prosper to some extent in trade and the focus moved actually from central, uh, uh, central, south central Java, uh, Jogjakarta area where Borobudur is, uh, probably as a result of uh, earthquakes and volcanoes and uh, the, the, uh, the focus of uh, the Mataram kingdom as it was called shifted to the uh, uh, Brantus uh, River Basin in uh, East Java. Uh, the Brantus River uh, sort of does a circular journey um, and ends up uh, uh, very near Surabaya. Um, but that, that's, uh, uh, that brings us to the Majapahit uh, Empire. Now the Majapahits uh, were the result really of the amal amalgamation of uh, kingdoms uh, of, uh, of East Java uh, into one which was not only strong but had uh, uh, links it could control the trade uh, with the Eastern Islands and, uh, and therefore also with uh, Srivijaya. Um, it came uh, in its earlier days, it was a king called Kertanagara. Um, uh, it was uh, the subject of a Chinese invasion. Uh, Chinese emperor at the time, Kublai Khan, Mongol emperor. Uh, this was the first time the Chinese had really actually tried to demand uh, political allegiance from uh, the uh, countries in the, in the, uh, to the south. Um, Kublai Khan invaded, tried to invade Japan, tried to invade Vietnam, tried to invade Java, sent a, a large army to Java, um, got tricked by the Javanese, uh, ambushed, and had to sail home again. Uh, 
as a result of which, anyway, the Majapahit uh, uh, <coughs> Empire uh, prospered for, for another hundred or so years after that, uh, controlling, came, coming to control uh, Sumatra, uh, the coast of the peninsula, uh, what is now Singapore, then called Tamasek, um, and uh, various other uh, and, and also to the east, to Maluku, uh, Makassar, uh, and, and so on. Um, on. Very little, of course, remains of this uh, great empire, at least uh, in terms of uh, uh, architecture. That is about the largest single bit. This is uh, uh, the gate to Troul and the uh, Majapahit capital, uh, which is not very far from uh, inland from um, from Surabaya. Um, uh, that um, is a very interesting object um, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, this is uh, from a Majapahit era temple in central Java, uh, 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 penis, uh, which was a very common symbol in. Uh, Shivaite temples. Now, Shivaite uh, uh, version of Hinduism was uh, was very strong in Java, and therefore a lot of uh, uh, temples had phallic uh, images of this sort, and some of these still survive. Um, but that uh, one is interesting for another point of view. You can see that at the, near the head of the penis is uh, as, uh, some balls. Now, the, uh, it was a very common uh, practice in those days, not only in Java, in the Philippines, in Borneo, uh, and also in uh, Thailand, in Siam, and, and as far as Burma, um, for um, uh, beads or small balls to be inserted into the penis in that, uh, in that fashion. Uh, the most elaborate of them actually uh, were, were gold with little beads inside them uh, which tinkled. Uh, so this is a, it's a very interesting, uh, uh, from a uh, you know, sociological point of view, uh, there's some wonderful writings in, in uh, early Spanish uh, uh, descriptions of the Philippines about sexual practices and sexual freedoms and so on and so forth. And uh, it was, you know, to some extent, common throughout the uh, Austronesian, Asian Austronesian world until the arrival of uh, Islam and Christianity. Um, and you find the same in the early, uh, early descriptions, uh, uh, Chinese descriptions of, in the, in the main, of the mainland too, Siam, Cambodia, um, and the, the first uh, uh, Dutch uh, descriptions of uh, Taiwan. Uh, so uh, it's interesting that these that some of these characteristics remain. I mean, Philippines has been, uh, you know, under Catholicism now for 500 years. Uh, yet uh, the practices haven't really you know, changed dramatically given the fact that they're not supposed to have divorce, but still to this day, some 50% of the births are out of wedlock, and that you know, changing sexual partners is, is actually very, very common, um, despite the, uh, the church. Um, and as far as Java is concerned, although it was become Muslim, it has never had a tradition of multiple wives. Divorce is easy, but you know, having uh, two or three wives is simply you know, not regarded as, as uh, correct. Uh, and that, again, is a, is a, is a holdover to some from the um, uh, pre, uh, pre-Islamic uh, period. Uh, now, here we are reaching the Islamic period, period um, with, uh, again, thanks to traders uh, from uh, to some extent from, uh, in, uh, from uh, Arabia and Persia, but most of all Indian Muslim traders from Gujarat. Um, 
And this was at a time, uh, early 15th century, late 14th, early 15th centuries, that uh, um, Islam was seen as a, as a more modern religion. Uh, it was uh, less hierarchical than, than the Hindus. Um, and uh, it was also international. Uh, there were, you know, Muslims from all over. There was, you know, the, uh, and they were all they were traders, and they dominated. By then, they dominated trade in the Indian Ocean, and they uh, and they made converts in China, and so on and so forth. So, the uh, the trade, you know, the traders established themselves in uh, in North uh, uh, North Java, uh, the ports of North Java. Uh, and this one, this is actually uh, probably the oldest mosque in Java. Um, it's obviously been restored to some extent, but uh, anyway, this is in Dimak. Now, Dimak was described by the Dutch as being the, uh, uh, by far the most important port in North Java. Uh, <coughs> well, it's now about five kilometers from the sea. So you can see that there's been uh, uh, huge sh shifts uh, in, in geography. Uh, which have affected uh, these states. Um, anyway, uh, DMAC was, uh, was the first and went on uh, to uh, uh, defeat the uh, Majapahit um, in, the late, uh, in the late 15th century. Um, uh, now I'll stop, uh, I'll go on back to Islam in a minute, but uh, um, meanwhile we have uh, have the expeditions of uh, Zheng He. Uh, now, Zheng He is much uh, written about, um, and for good reason, that uh, he certainly had a very large fleet. Uh, he made seven separate expeditions around the uh, uh, Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean, and, uh, and touching the east coast of Africa. Uh, it was, uh, to a significant extent, a, a kind of showing the imperial flag. Uh, many smaller states were persuaded uh, that uh, they should not resist the request to send uh, um, envoys uh, to Beijing to uh, admit that they was, uh, came under this sovereignty of the emperor in China. Uh, they certainly, you know, this didn't apply to all of them by any means. I mean, the Majapahit never, never caved in at all. I think, obviously, that uh, uh, by then the Chinese realized that the Javanese might be rather difficult. Um, but uh, it certainly was the first um, and, you know, really, uh, uh, um, sorry, so second effort uh, after uh, Kublai Khan uh, for China to bring naval power to bear in, in the seas to the south and, and, and west. Uh, what did it accomplish? Uh, it certainly for a while helped the development of certain states uh, Malacca in particular, and I'll go back to that in a second. Um, it did a little bit to encourage China trade with the, you know, the rest of the world, um, but actually not very much because uh, you know, the Ming dynasty later you know, clamped down on foreign trade. So uh, it uh, didn't accomplish very much in terms of you know, navigation because it didn't go anywhere that people hadn't been going for, for, for for, you know, for a thousand years. Uh, but it certainly made an impact and it was certainly big. But how big, we don't know. The descriptions of ships, which are you know, 140 meters long, are frankly you know, uh, regarded as ridiculous by naval experts. And, you know, these, are, these are the sort of things that arrive from inexact in translations and, and things written long after the event. It is interesting, there were two documents written at the time by Chinese who accompanied some of the voyages, and they never made any mention of the size of the vessels at all. Uh, they wrote a lot about where they went and what they saw, 
uh, but they didn't say anything about the vessel's size. Um, but you know, people still write you know stories about how they, they had these 140 meter you know wooden ships. Um, and it's also interesting that the only accounts are actually Chinese. So there are no Arab references to any of these voyages, uh, which is rather curious. But anyway, that's uh, that may be just chance. But uh, uh, it does mean that the sources for all of these uh, you know, uh, major claims come from uh, Ming annals of much later, written much later, um, and with some uh, you know, uncertainties about what size and what their measurements really were. Um, but uh, again, I mean, the, um, the Portuguese, you know, the Portuguese got to Malacca 1511, so that's only 70-something 70, 70 years after Zheng He's last voyage, and he was also in Malacca. Now, the Portuguese wrote a lot about you know, what they saw and, and, uh, around the, the, uh, uh, these seas, uh, uh, as far east as, as Banda Archipelago and, uh, and, and the whole Indian Ocean and, and uh, Sri Lanka and so on and so forth. They described all, you know, all these places, but they described, the, they said, the, by far the biggest ships were the Javanese ships. And there was a very good reason for that, because the Javanese had these huge, very slow vessels, which were sort of, uh, uh, you tramped around the region, uh, and whole families lived on board, and, you know, lived and died on board, and, and they just moved around transporting whatever goods needed to be transported. And the Portuguese, I mean, defeated them with, uh, with much smaller vessels because the Portuguese ones were uh, more maneuverable and they had much better fire uh, cannons. But uh, <coughs> uh, it's interesting that, uh, um, the, again, the Portuguese uh, were slightly dismissive about Chinese junks compared with the uh, Javanese ones. And of course, the word mm. junk is indeed a, a Javanese word. Uh, well, via Portuguese. Um, uh, the one thing that I say that he, that, that uh, Zheng He unquestionably did do was to um, boost the uh, position of Malacca. Malacca had been a very small uh, port, um, tiny compared with Pasai just across on the on the, the other side of the Straits, or even or indeed with uh, even with Tamasic. Um, and it wasn't even Muslim, it was actually uh, run by a guy who was a refugee, he was a, a Sri Vijayan refugee um, prince. Um, anyway, the, the, the details of all that are somewhat obscure, but uh, uh, he probably didn't become Muslim until about the time of Zheng He's second voyage. Uh, by the way, yes, yeah, so th those are, uh, just going back to ship sizes, uh, that's uh, 16, 1600 Dutch engraving showing uh, uh, in the foreground is a Javanese junk uh, characteristic sails. In the middle background is a Chinese junk, and then the smaller Javanese vessel in in the uh, in the background. And here we have a, 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 a outrigger, uh, little outrigger vessel, uh, which would have been feeding the uh, other ships. This was uh, off Banten, which was the first uh, Dutch uh, um, base in, uh, in Java before they took uh, Bata what became Batavia uh, soon, after, soon after this. Um, uh, anyway, just uh, going back to Malacca for a moment, uh, Malacca became the most important trading uh, place of the region, um, attracting uh, traders from literally everywhere. And, uh, and when the Portuguese conquered it in 1511, partly as a result of internal disputes, uh, they soon got it back working again as it had before. 
with you know people from uh, traders from all over. They talk about sixty languages being spoken and. and uh, uh, Indians were the, probably the biggest traders, followed by the Javanese, and then the, the, the Chinese and Champa, and, uh, and uh, 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 Okinawa, and, and so uh, they were all in there doing trade. And meanwhile, of course, Malacca uh, remained, in a sense, the, 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 the hub of the Malay world. But when it was conquered by the, uh, the Portuguese, quite a lot of Muslim traders left, and uh, settled in other ports in the region and took Islam with them. So that uh, Brunei, for example, uh, became Muslim as a result of the movement of traders from Malacca. Uh, uh, the same was probably the case with Makassar, which was later to become uh, the uh, you know, second only to uh, um, uh, Malacca. Well, I mean, it was actually became more important than Malacca. Uh, it became uh, the most important of the trading sultanates uh, and remains so after the arrival of the Europeans and you know the Dutch in partic were particularly aggressive and then the English but uh, Macassar survived until uh, as an independent uh, until the mid late 8th uh, 17th century and even after that after it was uh, its freedoms were curtailed by the Dutch uh, remained a very important uh, place trading uh, with China um, as well as with the uh, Eastern Archipelago and, uh, and, and, the, and of the Dutch themselves. Um, the Sultan of Makassar uh, back in the early 17th century actually was an extremely enlightened person. He was very well read. Uh, he had uh, he allowed freedom of religion, uh, churches and mosques and uh, whatever you wanted. So you, if you wanted to trade, you could trade. Um, and he made a very famous statement, which is still quoted um, in the context of the seas. He said, God divided the land among men, but the sea he gave in common and ever it shall remain thus. So, anybody who's interested in the survival of international trade, and international trade must largely go by sea. It always has, and it always will, because uh, whatever you m may say about land transport, it is always going to be, you know, at least ten times more expensive than sea transport. And it's been that way since Roman times, and it will always be that way, and it, and it tells you why. Although there's been you know, a thousand and one books written about the Silk Road, there was far more uh, shipping, uh, sorry, there was far more trade done on the sea between East and West than there ever was on, uh, on the Silk Road, at least the Silk Road as far as it's seen as, as kind of going all the way from China to, to, uh, uh, to, to Istanbul. Um, there were bits of, of the so-called Silk Road which, which were um, more active, but there were only bits of it, mainly in Central Asia, Bukhara, Samarkand, around there. Um, so, how's it, how are we going for time? All right, well, we'll move on a bit. Uh, we'll just... Uh, uh, some of the other features of, of this, uh, of Austronesian Asia at that time, uh, that's... Uh, uh, um, that, that's a, a book produced by the Spanish in Manila, uh, and it's written in uh, Tagalog script as well as in Latin. Uh, Christian, it's called Doctrina Christiana. Uh, that uh, is another example of, uh, of many. Uh, uh, scripts which were um, around the region. That's from uh, uh, from the that's Bugis script from um, from um, South Sulawesi. Uh, uh, so that, that, that there was a tradition of um, writing. Uh, it didn't it didn't produce great books, and uh, except in to some extent in Java, but. Uh, 
uh, it was certainly very common and uh, the Spanish when they got to the Philippines remarked on, on the fact that uh, uh, most women uh, were, could read and write. Simple stuff, but uh, uh, in, in there were different scripts. There was uh, uh, in in, in, um, in different regions, but they were all originally you know, derived from the Indian scripts, of the, uh, which was you know what became uh, Javanese script, uh, uh, the Kawi script. Um, and uh, of course, you still see that script in, uh, in the street signs in uh, Jogjakarta. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, main impact of uh, Europeans was uh, uh, not only to gradually to come to dominate trade, but to uh, 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 enable, whether or not deliberately, uh, the arrival of far more Chinese traders. Uh, that was the uh, burning of the Chinese uh, in Batavia in uh, 1740. Um, there, was, there was a lot of reaction. You had massacres of Chinese uh, there and in Manila. Um, uh, that's a Javanese uh, document. Uh, that's, uh, that's Makassar at um, the time just after the Dutch took it over. Um, this is uh, Stanford Raffles, who uh, his intent in setting up Singapore was to break the Dutch monopoly of trade. Um, and he was very successful, but uh, unfortunately, from the point of view of the local sultans, um, who had been forced to who had been traders themselves, but had then been forced into monopoly situations with the Dutch, that uh, they were unable to take advantage of the freedoms that uh, um, Singapore under Raffles offered because that was very soon uh, taken up mainly by uh, Western traders, by Chinese, and to some extent by Bugis traders from, uh, from Makassar. Um, but it leads on, of course, to you know, the, the second phase of, of Chinese uh, movement into Southeast Asia, um, which uh, was resulted, of course, from um, the demands for raw materials from the West, um, for uh, tin, for uh, later for rubber, uh, for all kinds of other things, um, which required labor, and labor had always been in short supply uh, in in uh, in this region. Uh, whereas labor was in more than plentiful in, in China. Uh, so that was why Chinese came to move in large numbers to particularly to uh, Malaya, Singapore, but also to, uh, to um, uh, what is now Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, so uh, you, you get a change in the demographics, uh, which has you know, had and continues to have huge political consequences. Um, now I went to, uh, well I just very briefly go through a couple more uh, illustrations and then perhaps we can have some discussion. Uh, uh, that is the uh, Sultan of Sulu in the 1800s. Sulu had been, well it was regarded as sort of pirate state, but actually its piracy was perfectly legitimate because the Spanish kept trying to take it over so they retaliated by, you know, um, constantly attacking uh, into Visayas and sometimes even as far as Luzon. Um, and they weren't really suppressed until the late 19th century. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that was one of the sultans um, in the 19th century. Um, of course, his successors now claim, uh, uh, well, <laughs> they claim Sabah where in fact Samba of Sulu was, had originally been part of Borneo, uh, with Brunei. Um, so the thing is very confusing. Um, brings us to the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the uh, Philippines is often regarded as being outside this uh, Austronesian region, being outs somehow not part of, 
uh, the Malay, the wider Malay world. This is, of course, complete nonsense, and it results from two things. First of all, uh, Spain, uh, not only you know bringing Christianity, but more significantly, uh, the Spanish ruled um, Philippines from uh, Mexico. So it, it was, as far as trade was concerned, the Spanish only cared about trade between Mexico, the silver coming from Mexico and Peru, and then Chinese and Japanese coming to Manila to buy, uh, 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 sorry, to, to sell goods in exchange for silver. Um, the trade that uh, the Philippines used to have with Malacca and, and, and rest of the region of, of, uh, to the west uh, simply uh, died out. Uh, and the Spanish were actually in no position uh, to do much about it because it was such a long way to go from, from, Sp from Spain via, via Mexico. Uh, and uh, as a result, of course, you know, the, 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 the Spanish having been there very early on, but the, you know, then the Dutch and the English moved in and they were coming you know, the other way around. Um, so they, they you know, soon you know, pushed the Sp Spanish off the map as far as Southeast Asia was concerned. Um, and the other thing was they weren't really interested in trade. The Dutch and the British were more interested in trade than they were in religion. Uh, so that's how they came to you know, uh, be the dominant powers uh, for a while. Uh, which brings us actually to um, uh, say the I Malay identity. Uh, the gentleman on the left here, uh, Rizal, uh, the original modern nationalist in this region. Uh, this is a person who uh, wasn't a, you know, didn't come from an old sultan family or, you know, the old aristocracy. This was a new educated person who believed in, in, uh, in uh, liberation of the country from foreigners and in the uh, identity of the wider Malay world as well as, I mean, he was himself a Tagalog and wrote in Tagalog as well as in Spanish and English and he could even write in German as well. But uh, uh, he was very conscious of uh, this, uh, uh, of the Philippines as being part of this wider Malay world. Unfortunately, of course, as we all know, uh, instead of getting rid of the Spanish uh, and becoming independent, uh, Filipinos ended up under the rule of the Americans, uh, who again, of course, looked across the Pacific. So it's only in recent years that uh, this uh, uh, Philippine part of the great archipelago has begun to think in terms uh, of looking, looking uh, towards the rest of Asia rather than across the Pacific. Um, so, with that uh, bit of uh, uh, history, I think I shall stop talking um, and let you uh, ask any questions you like. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Really uh, detailed and, uh, and uh, you've done a lot of research into that, obviously. Never, and I want to get to your questions, too, since so we've got a little bit of time. But first, I want to ask you, what why did you first decide to start researching this area? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'd, I'd written a book before, and, you know, and I wasn't employed full-time as a journalist. And, uh, and then I realized you know, that I was quite ignorant myself of the, of the history of this region before about you know, 1800. And then I realized that most other people were as well. And then I realized that there was no you know, book uh, which was, you know, first of all, identified this uh, Austronesian region, mm -hmm. and secondly, uh, didn't focus just on the last 200, 300 years, but went back in time, mm -hmm. you know, particularly to the, I mean, the, the glory days of the Malay world were actually before Islam. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, that's, you know, something that, you know, a lot of modern states, and we've got all these new modern states, and often they, they're rather shy of their earlier history for, you know, for 
religious reasons or you know other reasons they don't really uh, like to focus on on these things but I mean, you know that's the reality yeah? Uh, and also, I mean, uh, those of us familiar with your columns, for example, in, in, the, in the South China Morning Post, know you, you've written about the South China Sea from the current, you know, dispute angle. But when you started researching this book, and I think it took you a couple of years on and off during the research, anything that really surprised you or something that you really didn't know that jumped out at you as you were doing the research? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the extent of a Javanese shipping I think, I mean, I, you know, I knew about Madagascar in a vague kind of way, but I didn't realize, and you, one, the, there's a lot more about this, about the impact on Africa and so on, that one could, you know, uh, is, is actually in the book, but uh, uh, that certainly, it, 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 did, it did surprise me, and uh, particularly then, you know, in the context, well, where does Jim Herf fit into all this, and, and uh, you know, relative to uh, mm. the other trading, uh, people and, and countries and uh, uh, the fact was that you didn't have big states mm. you know in the sense of a China um, but you did have a lot of small and very active states which were um, you know reliant very heavily on on trade uh, speaking of John now every time I've been in China and I was living in Beijing and Shanghai and I would talk to scholars there about the current claimed the South China Sea, and John Doe's name always came up as the one who kind of staked it out. But you well, say, I mean, say I don't know, it's a nonsense. I mean, you know, let's face it, let me do, I mean, I've talked to, you know, about all the people who've been sailing these seas for, you know, a thousand years before, you know? I mean, you know, the Javanese were in Madagascar, what, at least 800 years before, before Jen Hur. Uh, so, you know, and I mean, just look at the map. I mean, who are the you know the, the the South China Sea as we as we now call it, although that's actually a very recent uh, an English you know term. Uh, I mean, seventy five percent is is, is non Chinese, yeah. And what is now Vietnamese used to be Cham, so you know. Uh, and of course, Taiwan was wasn't Chinese until well, let's say the Qing, late you know Qing Dynasty. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, one, one, one's uh, uh, talking about the past, you know, long before Zheng He. And Zheng He was, uh, you know, look, he had several voyages, but he didn't, you know, China didn't establish any permanent presence. China's permanent presence was established by, uh, by traders and by migrants. Uh, you know, the uh, government in, in Beijing actually didn't want to have anything to do with these people. Um, I mean, it was long forbidden to, to, to go overseas. Of course, it didn't you know, stop people, but um, you know, the, the Chinese presence in the region is, is entirely you know, uh, uh, driven by individuals, not by and families, not not by government. And you know, I think if you look at, I mean, China was always very important as far as from the point of view of trade for other, other countries, because China was very big. But if you put it the other way around, was trade important for China? The answer was no. And, you know, um, I mean, most of the trade that China was, you know, most of the imports that China uh, was making were not absolute necessities. I mean, unlike other, you know, some other countries, I mean, around this region, uh, I mean, a lot of places didn't even grow rice. So, I mean, you know, they had fish or they did, you know, various other things. They had a mine, or, but they didn't grow rice, so they had to import rice from the, somewhere else, you know, maybe from, uh, you know, um, Siam or, or wherever. And, uh, um, and I think you know, it's true, I mean, you, you get carried away now by the fact that, you know, trade has been incredibly important to China for the last 20, 30 years. But, you know, when I first came you know, to Hong Kong, and it, China trade was minimal, and it had been minimal, yeah, it, it, you know, until the latter Qing dynasty, yeah, and, and it was only under the impact of foreign, you know, foreign devils of one sort or another that, that, that uh, um, and what, and then again, of course, you know, under under Mao Zedong, it was of no importance at all. Um, so it was only Deng Xiaoping's 
uh, opening up and the need uh, to modernize and the modernizing needed to trade and needed to transfer of technology and investment and so on. Uh, but that's not necessarily going to be the case you know, forever. I mean, China is going to be uh, is becoming more self-sufficient again. If so, you know, in, in another 25 years, you know, uh, maybe, you know, China will be sort of saying, well, you know, do we really need to bother about all these places? We got, we've got issues at home, we've got issues on our borders. I mean, why, why were the Junho voyages stopped? They were stopped because they were too expensive, there was no return um, from them. Meanwhile, where were the threats? They were the northern border, the western border, and they still are. No. That's, you know, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, before, before I get to audience questions, one, explain the nine dash line. Where did that come from? Well, uh, well uh, the nine dash line, I mean, it was originally seven dash, ah. and it was a response by uh, China, uh, Deng Kai-shek, I think, um, in the 30s, to a French claim on the uh, Spratly Islands, because French then occupying you know, Vietnam and Cambodia. And this was a Chinese response. And, and, and uh, I mean, it was a, you know, I think somebody just produced a map and you know, said, this is ours. And, and that, 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 that was it. Nothing much <laughs> happened about it uh, you know, for you know, quite a long time. Until oh, oil was discovered. Well, yeah, but oil wasn't, no, I don't, uh, you see, I think that oil, uh, this is, you know, it's a strategic thing. It's not, it's, there isn't actually that much oil in the South China Sea. I mean, it's useful for Vietnam, for Malaysia, and so on. It's not, it's not big stuff as far as China's concerned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody from the audience have any thoughts or questions or comments about this? Yeah. Here. I wonder if you say that about uh, Taiwan. Uh, from a, a thick point of view, because I believe that the Aboriginal population is also Austronesian, and the languages spoken by uh, these people are very close, very close to um, of Thai, for example, and, and other South Asian languages. So they are very. There's a history of of uh, connection. Um, and uh, I wonder if you looked at that at all. Well, I mean, uh, uh, Thai, uh, Thai is not an Austronesian language, it's Austroasiatic, but uh, um, certainly, you know, with the Taiwanese languages, and there are several, um, are all Austronesian languages. And uh, I mean, there, there is, perhaps the main theory is that actually the spread of Austronesian languages started from Taiwan. Um, and um, you know, possibly originally from the mainland. Yeah. But the, you know, the curious thing is, there are no Austronesian languages on the mainland, except what little is left in uh, in, in Vietnam, the, the remnants of uh, Champa. Um, uh, but certainly, you know, the the Taiwanese, uh, you know, the, you know, they had <coughs> some of them had very direct links with the uh, um, people of northern Luzon and the Philippines, you know, linguistic links and probably earlier trading links, although they didn't really, didn't trade much, the uh, Taiwanese. Um, but it's interesting how the Dutch describe them as, uh, as being very tall. Now, given the fact that the Dutch are the tallest people <laughs> in the world, <laughs> so, <laughs> that they must have been fairly striking. Um, uh, because they were, you know, they, they were meat eaters. They had, you know, huge quantities of, of deer and things, and they, you know, they hunted. And uh, well, they grew a bit of rice and roots, and vegetables, and so on. But they, they were, they were meat eaters. And, yeah. Well, so um, I'm actually quite curious about the Terra Blue Centaria, which was shown in the first page of the book cover. And then, uh, for me, it's a really new concept. Like in my past research, we all know. Nusantara, but then the word Nusantara is like a complete new idea to me. Like I was uh, wondering to like, elaborate more on uh, what's the difference between Nusantara and Nusantara and how this term like uh, came about. Uh, well, this, this term, it, uh, you know, it's, it's <coughs> was adopted 
Um, I mean, I didn't quite invent it, but I certainly adopted it. Simply because uh, I wanted to describe a region which was somewhat bigger than the original Nusantara. Now, Nusantara in Javanese meant the old Majapahit sort of empire. Uh, uh, Nusantara in modern Malay refers to the archipelago, with basically the Indonesian archipelago. Um, doesn't include, it really doesn't include the Philippines. It doesn't, certainly doesn't include Taiwan. It doesn't include you know, uh, the, the old Champa. So uh, Nusantara was, a, was an extension in the same way that you get, you know, Malaya became Malaysia when it extended itself to you know, North Borneo. Uh, or, you know, we talk about Australasia, meaning you know, uh, Australia plus the you know, um, smaller places in the vicinity. Uh, so, yeah, and it also comes from uh, the, the word Nusantau. Now, Nusantau means island people. Tau meaning people in many Austronesian languages. So again, there is a sort of, a, you know, uh, there wasn't a word, you know, in common use um, to describe what actually uh, a region which did have a common identity. Um, and you could have called it, you know, I could you know, for some days do call it Asian, uh, Austronesian Asia, but that's a mouthful, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, so this entire area just is a, is a an effort to have a word which defines something which hitherto had not been really defined in, in these terms. And, you know, people were talking about Southeast Asia. Well, I mean, Southeast Asia is a, is a very vague concept. It's a geographical concept, uh, which, in, you know, I mean, is Burma part of Southeast Asia or not? It used to be part of, you know, South Asia. You know, I mean, the, these things are going to be moved around on, on, a, on, a, on a board. You know? um, whereas when we talk about Austronesia, we can talk about uh, a region where the common basic language. Questions, comments, or thoughts? Well, I'll have one if you do. Oh, yeah. So, so I mean, does it make any sense at all to think of uh, the modern organization as the act has been Related to the story, is it a product of the story, or completely unrelated? I don't know. I mean, ASEAN was a, you know, was a political construct of the you know, 1960s. Uh, anyway, it's quite successful, uh, but it's sort of changed its nature over time, having been sort of anti-communist front to being a sort of a, a trade, uh, trade cooperation area. Uh, so it's successful from that point of view. But you can see, I think, in the issues over the uh, South China Sea, um, you know, a divide. You know, every time they have a meeting, there's a divide, and it, it is between mainland and, uh, and, and uh, island and, well, plus Vietnam, because Vietnam has such a huge coastline. Um, you know, Thailand has a bit of coastline, Cambodia has a bit, but they're not really involved in any, any disputes with anybody, but it's, uh, um, the, uh, the others all are, you know, was, you know. Uh, so there is a divide between most of the mainland and the, and the uh, uh, and maritime states. You, you covered a lot of time and a lot of space there. Mm -hmm. Just talk for one second about the establishment of the Chinese diaspora in that part of the world. You mentioned that in the 1700s they showed up because of an excess of labor in China, but well, surely in some places they were there earlier. Right? Well, I mean, they were there, I mean, I mean, in very small numbers from about the 14th century, from some, uh, well, the time of Kublai Khan, there was a few, uh, um, uh, Wang Daiyan, who was uh, writing in the 14th century, mentioned uh, <coughs> that there were small Chinese communities in you know, uh, one or two places. Um, uh, but the, you know, the big growth didn't come until the development of, of the largest you know, cities under, uh, particularly under you know, Dutch and then later British influence in terms of developing trade and then of course the arrival and uh, of, of um, mass you know 
mass migration, which was a 19th century phenomenon, really, from about 1840 onwards up until 1930. Yeah. Included to the US. <laughs> well, yeah, but then that was, you know, the US was actually quite small. I mean, most of it was to uh, Southeast Asia until, um, you yeah, know, until the 20th century. Yeah. And, and when you were speaking, I, was, I made a note, mental note to ask you because you mentioned how most trade was maritime because that's mm. the most efficient, yeah. you know, cheapest way to move goods. Right now, China is building this massive infrastructure that's going to stretch through Western China into Europe all the way to well, Western uh, yeah, Europe to I mean, move goods. You don't, do you see that as a game changer? In terms no, of not really. I mean, no, it's still much more expensive. It's quicker than sea, of course, but it's not very quick. Um, and let's face it, I mean, you know, the, the, this is nothing new. The Russians have had railway to Vladivostok since 18, I can't remember when. But I mean, yeah. And for a while, they, in the, back in the, in the 70s, they tried to develop cross, you know, a, tra a, you know, a, a transit route from Vladivostok from Makhodka uh, through to, you know, to, you know the, the west, to Germany. But it never, it, it sort of always existed a bit. Uh, and the Chinese uh, venture will probably prosper more because you know you can move. There's a lot of goods to be moved from central China, so you know it'll make it'll make sense for for some things. But it's not going to be a game changer. No. Uh, uh. And if no more audience questions, last one for me. No, last one for me is: Will the book be published in Chinese? Well, yeah, well, I, I don't know. It's going to be published in Malay, I'm told. It's going to be published in Malay. Yeah, okay. I know. So, uh, Chinese, I don't know. Any volunteers to publish in Chinese? <laughs> you do the translations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, I want to thank uh, Philip Bowering. Uh, this was a really interesting, fascinating historical look. You covered a lot of centuries in a yeah, well, <laughs> short period yeah. of time. Sorry, I do uh, my Pictures weren't quite right either, but anyway. Yeah. And if you're if you're you're part of the university community here, you know we only have another two weeks left of uh, classes, and then you're going to have a lot of time over the summer to do your reading. So if you want to do some reading, there's a book available in the back, this one here, and the author is here to sign, which is the best gift you could possibly give yeah. someone. It's yeah. a signed book by the author. Right. So uh, <laughs> I want to just say once again thanks to uh, the Hong Kong History Department for co-sponsoring this, the Hong Kong Library for helping us put it on and giving us this nice space. And uh, thanks to Philip Bowery. Oh, right. no. Thank you very much. Thank you.